Up to 20,000 Irish people flock to Medjugorje every year, and some are seeking to be healed. Some are spirit, simply looking for spiritual enlightenment. Some report experiences of miracles, and some speak of supernatural visions. So I'd like you to meet two people here in the audience. We have Maureen Marr and her daughter, Louise Hall. You're very welcome. And Maureen, you were one of the first people to take a number of, uh, I suppose, tourists, if you want to call them that, pilgrims out to see uh, things happening in Medjugorje. And when you were there, you did see something extraordinary. Would you share what you saw with us? I will, Ryan, but I don't want you to think I'm a visionary or anyone, yeah, anything I like that. Never. I'm just an ordinary Absolutely. house. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'm grandmother, and um, I share my story with you. Please do. When I was there one of the times, I was outside St. James's Church, mm -hmm. and there were a group of pilgrims um, looking up at the, the sky, the sun, and even though um, I was afraid to look up because I figured, you know, my eyes would be affected, mm -hmm. I, I did anyway. And instead of the sun, I saw the host. And it came down towards me, and right in the center were the letters IHS. And then I saw um, a, a cross which, took, which seemed to fill the sky. And it was surrounded by lights. And um, there appeared then um, an image of Padre Peel. And um, I saw, then finally I saw a, a dove and transformed into the image of Our Lady and she came down towards me and um, I felt this tremendous sense of peace and love and that has stayed with me always. And how long did that whole experience take? I suppose, I suppose it took about maybe five minutes, yeah. ten minutes. Did it feel longer it when you were there? It was very quick. It did, and I, yeah. I just wanted to see more. Sure. But it disappeared. And when you tell, were you frightened, by the way, when that happened? No, I wasn't. You weren't kind of no. freaked out or scared by No, I, I knew it was before. something supernatural that I was experiencing. Okay. And I, I was actually down on my knees, and I just wanted to see more. Yeah. And I, I wasn't in ecstasy or anything. I was yeah. just normal. Because, you know, do you remember when some people were talked about before watching, uh, say, a moving statue? And I know it's not the same thing. And they said that if you looked at the sun for too long, that your eyes would play tricks on you mm -hmm. or, you know, that you, you, you might be seeing things that simply aren't there. Do you believe what you saw was very much there, very vivid, very real, almost? To yes, the, well, well I, I know it sounds incredible, but for me, it was very real. Okay. Very good. Louise, you, you have a, a rosary beads with you. They, they don't belong to you. They belong to a lady who's a little shy to come and tell us her story this evening, which we understand completely. Would you, would you tell us what, what the, the significance of these rosary beads? Yeah, please? sure. Um, these beads belong to a lady called Una Keneally, who's mm -hmm. been to Medjugorje several times. And on one of her visits when she was over there, she was in the grounds of St. James's Church. And a little girl of about seven came running out of the church saying, Mommy, Mommy, my silver beads have turned gold. And this memory stuck in Una's head so that when she went back to Dublin, she decided she was going to get herself a pair of beads to bring over with her. She knew she'd be going again. Yeah. So she went into a little religious shop in Clarendon Street near the church, and she bought the cheapest pair of silver beads. And she said she put them under her pillow, and sometimes she would pray with them. She went over to Medjugorje about eight months later, and after confession, she was sitting in the grounds of St. James's Church, and a woman beside her said, I think my husband's beads have changed colour. She took her own beads out, and as you can see, they turned this gold colour. So they were silver on purchase and gold after, mm -hmm. what, do you think, something miraculous or...? Well, there were, this is not the only story of rosary beads turning gold. This right, happened right. a lot in the early days, in the 80s and the 90s in Medjugorje, okay. and many people still have their beads. And I suppose maybe it's symbolic of the richness of her faith because she was praying on them and she felt so much over there and a closeness to God over there. But these beads, this would have been back in the 80s or the, you know, the late 80s, yes, early yes. 90s, and there's still that colour today. Have you, have you been to Medjugorje from time to time? Yeah, I've been to Medjugorje. Did you ever see the visions as described by Mark? No, I you haven't see, seen see anything, anything yeah. you know, out of the ordinary. Yeah. The only experience I would have had was last August but it was seen by many people, and that was um, on the Feast of the Assumption, the yeah. 15th of August, during the consecration at Mass, people were looking up at the sky, and I was saying, what are they looking at? And there was a huge crucifix in the sky. Mm -hmm. Now, people could say it was a cloud formation or it was the contrails of a plane, 
But when you're there staring at this, it was perfectly symmetrical yeah. and it was like it was illuminated and balancing. And people took pictures and it came out. So, it came out, so, so you believe mm. that? But that I was wasn't the only person. There were many, everyone that was in the grounds of the church. I, I so. was more in the one that you described the, the host emerging from the sun. Did you ever see yes. anything else uh, along those lines when you were over there? Well, I had two experiences. Yeah. And the other one was at the Blue Cross, which is at the base of Apparition yeah. Hill. And, and Our Lady appears there regularly. Well, what I saw was, um, it was a very still day, and there was a little kind of a handkerchief on, on the branch of the tree, yes. and it was moving gently, and I had a vision of Our Lady, but she was crying, mm -hmm. and I, I, the tears were trickling down my cheeks as well, and I saw um, popes, cardinals, bishops, and... Um, where, 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 later on, where were they? Where, where well, it, it was like they were, they were in a park, this was in the sky or on the ground? No, no, no. This was this was at the at the Blue Cross. At the cross, at and the, they were walking the around cross. this cross. They were cross. walking around. They were all walking around, and they were very real, very, sorry, very human. And um, I, I often, with the challenges that the church was going through, yeah. I often reflect back yeah. on that vision. And what what about people who are very skeptical, who don't have religion, don't have the same faith as you, who think you your your eyes are playing tricks on you? How, how mm -hmm. do you how do you square things with with people like who feel that way? Well, everyone's entitled to their opinion, course, opinion yeah. Ryan. Yeah. And for me, like, those two experiences were very real. And there are a lot of people, and I'm not the only one who has had spiritual experiences in Medjugorje. Sure. You know, there are people who have had extraordinary spiritual experiences Many of whom are watching the programme well. tonight, by the way, and we've spoken to them on, on different programmes. So, as you yeah. see, horses for courses. And exactly. But thanks yeah. for sharing yeah. your story with us, because we have Damien Richardson and yes. David Parks who uh, join us uh, this evening. I'd like to welcome you to the show, gentlemen. It's nice Thank to see you, you too, because you both have stories that involve Medjugorje and, um, and what, I suppose, uh, influence that place, a very special place to so many people has had on you. So if I could start with you, Damien, um, yeah, and, and, you know, your, your first trip to, to, to this place and what brought you there? Yeah, well, yeah, I didn't choose to go, you know. Uh, I grew up in a good family, a good loving home, you know. Yeah. Uh, in the early days, I caught up in the rave culture. I got addicted to ecstasy. Uh, shortly after that, I got addicted to heroin as well, you know. Uh, my father was a good man of faith. He was always praying, you know. And uh, he, someone showed him a video of Medjugorje, you know. And on the video, there was two American girls. And they had been addicted to drugs, and he went to Medjugorje and got healed, you know. Yeah. So my dad was thinking, right, I have to get down to Medjugorje, you know. I'd say you, you weren't a willing participant at that yeah, stage, were you? It, was on, it wasn't on my list of things to do, to be honest, <laughs> at that imagine. age, you know. So how and, did he get you over there? Basically, just, I was at the come out of prison, I did, you know, that way. And, uh, you came out of prison at that stage, right? Yeah, I was at the come out of prison. And, what, and, what, uh, what were you in for? Just petty crimes and that, okay. you know. It's, 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 Feed the habit? Yeah, the addiction okay. leads to that, you know. I understand. And, uh, he showed me all these brochures of the lovely Croatian beach and all the lakes and all. And he says, there's a little chapel there, but kind of tricked me into going, you know. Okay. So I kind of let him down a few times. I was always lying to him and let him down. So I felt he had the arm to go, you know, that way. So you got, well, let's get to the airport first. Yeah. Dublin airport. Yeah, just, I would have been taking drugs before I went on the plane, you know, that way. Just, that, that was the life I was leading, you know. So you're very committed to your narcotic life yeah. at that stage. Yeah. You, get to, you get to Medjugorje eventually. Yeah. What, what was your, your, your epiphany? What was your moment? Yeah, I first got there, I said, Jamie, like the, the drugs is wearing off, you know, and just said, Jamie, what am I doing here, you know, that way? Uh, I didn't sleep the first four nights, uh, weather was very hot, you know, that way, the effects of the drugs. And uh, I was walking down the village the far night, there was a beautiful statue of a lady in the main street, yeah. and there's a bench there, and uh, I got about half an hour sleep, it was about five o'clock in the morning. But I woke up that morning, and I had a beautiful sense of peace in my heart. Uh, something very profound I've never experienced before or after, you know. And uh, it was like illumination of conscience or something. It was a deep impact on my okay. life, you know. So when you got back to Ireland, yeah. were you able to maintain that sense of change or did it, did you go off the rails again? What happened to you? Yeah, well, it was in, just, just to jump back to mention, yeah. God, that, that, that day in particular I met a, a lovely person, uh, Billy, Billy Connors from Wexford, and he brought me the confession. That was a big thing for me. Uh, I mean, a great experience that week, you know. Yes. When I did come back to Dublin, I was going with a girlfriend. Uh, I fell back into the whole drug situation, yeah. you know. Okay, and your, yourself and your then girlfriend, yeah. Mary, yeah. Uh, were, uh, you were both on drugs, on the heavy drugs. Yeah, we were on drugs, we were, and as I said, something had changed to me in Medjugorje, and yeah. I wanted to come off the drugs. 
So I went to my doctor, and uh, he put me on uh, Fiseptone, and he changed it to methadone. Right. So I was on it for six years. It was a methadone program, you know. What happened in 2002? Uh, basically, just, as I said, myself and my girlfriend, we were on drugs. Uh, we had our first child. She was born a methadone baby. Uh, it would have been 2002. Because of the methadone, I felt very, de very depressed and very suicidal, and then just gave up hope to live, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Uh, it was just like basically just on a, on a slow way to death, you know? And uh, I just went to my mother and my sister, I said, listen, I can't do this anymore, I feel very suicidal. So within three days, I had ended up back in Medjugorje again, you know? Yeah, and you went to the, 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 the house there that... Uh... Yeah, one of the fruits of Medjugorje, there was uh, an Italian nun, Mother Elvira, and he, she started the community for drug addicts. Uh, she's 60 houses around the world, and one of the main houses in Medjugorje, you know? Yeah. So I went up to the house, and the lads there, I, I told my story, you know? And he said, listen, he says, the drugs is not the problem. He says, they'll always be there, you're the problem, you have to change your life, you know? And it changed your life, uh, because you have, how many children do you have now? Yeah, we're blessed, we have uh, uh, seven children of our own, and one foster child. So we have eight kids in the house now at the moment, you and, know? And you've been clean how many years? I've been clean 11 years now, my wife is clean 10 years, thank God, you know? and, and are you a, a big religious family? As, as well, a... I'm a practicing Catholic, so I love my Catholic faith, I love the history of it, you know, that way yeah. of say the rosy, being the kids to Mass, and... You know, it's, I don't know angels sitting here, but I do my best, you know, don't we? Yeah, I know, I appreciate that too. Yeah. So do you, do you pray together as a family? Oh, yeah, we pray to Rosie every night and really yeah. get blessings from her, you know? Good stuff. You got married in, what, 2005? 2005, we got married. We, we went back to Medjugorje for their honeymoon. Yeah. Uh, started my own business. And, uh, yeah, life is good at the moment, too. Yeah, okay, well, it's, it's a great story because yeah. obviously you came out of a very, very yeah. dark place. And as yeah. I say, now things are working much better for you. David, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Because you had what's called Crohn's disease. A lot That's of people right, yeah. watching will know what we're talking about. For those yeah. who don't, maybe you'd explain that, what it is. Uh, most debilitating illness. Uh, cramping, vomiting, diarrhea, constant pain. Constant pain. Constant pain. Yeah. And, and in 1989, the doctors pretty much gave you two weeks to live yeah two weeks two to weeks live. To live yeah. and what were you yeah. thinking at that point um well there were many thoughts going through and what the biggest thought was with re regards to my son ken who was born with cystic fibrosis and that's all i was worried about i wasn't worried about david parks and uh it was a difficult a diff really difficult and particularly financially as well were you a because a professional soccer player in my early years yes. and then i uh, was a professional musician from 1980 onwards. Were you a religious person? Uh, prior to Ken's birth, I would have said yes, but yeah. uh, after Ken's illness, you lost it was way. tough. Yeah. And then being involved in soccer, and then particularly the music business, I really lost the head altogether, yeah, unfortunately. It wasn't yeah. the place for coming no, up for Sunday no, Mass, I no, suppose. No, no. Um, when a friend offered you two tickets to Medjugorje, yeah. were you, were you um, jumping at the opportunity? Or no, how you... no, no. Um, that I felt it was the last thing that I needed in my life at the time was right. a pilgrimage. I'd been away from my faith for eight years. I hadn't been inside a Catholic church. Yes. And the only reason I accepted the offer was that Anne and I were married in 1972. And we spent our honeymoon in the former Yugoslavia in a little place called Saftat, which is quite close to the airport in Dubrovnik. And the guy, after a half an hour of trying to persuade me to go, his final statement was, you know what, David, on the way home from Medjugorje, we'll stop at a little place you've never heard of before called Saftat. Yeah. And we'll have dinner and we'll have mass. And I remember saying to him, no interest in mass, but dinner in Saftat is too good to pass up. You went, eventually got persuaded to go in yeah. as part of a healing session, is that yeah. what they call it? Yeah. Uh, what happened during that to you? Well, first of all, I ridiculed we had a wonderful priest from Chicago called Father Peter Mary Rookie, who's got great intercessory powers of healing. Met him at the airport, absolutely had a terrible time with him because he represented everything that I didn't have in my life, which was love and peace. Yes. And he was conducting a healing service in the graveyard of all places at the back of the church. And my wife Anne kept trying to persuade me to have a blessing, but not interested. As I said, I was with 165 religious maniacs at the time. So after two hours, I decided to get it over with. So Father Rookie uh, put a crucifix in my hand. He anointed my forehead with holy oil, placed his hands on my head, and then I collapsed in, into a state that they call resting in the spirit. Yes. And I was in that state for 20 minutes. And when I got up off the ground, I was looking up into the face of Senator Donny Cassidy. Of all people. Who was, of all people, not the prettiest face to be looking at. But... Uh, I, I didn't know what happened. Like, I couldn't understand how I ended up on the ground. And I, I took two paces back to Donny and said, Donny, who hit me? 
Yeah. And he said to me, Parks, he said, the Holy Spirit is with you. Right. You've been out for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. What happened when you got back to see your doctor in Dublin? Um, well, I'd been with him two days before going to Medjugorje, pleading with him for medication to try and take away the pain. I was 99 pounds in weight. I looked like death warmed up. He had to sign a, an insurance waiver to allow me to travel. So when Anne and I went, presented ourselves two days after coming back from Medjugorje, he looked up from his table and he just said to me, David, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And then he invited me to go into hospital to have some tests, which we did. And then 10 days after that, he called to say that there was no sign of Crohn's disease in my body. At and all? It totally disappeared, yeah. Mm -hmm. just, just vanished? Like that, yeah. mm -hmm. And is there a known cure for Crohn's disease? No. No. <gasps> no, they can try and keep it under, under control or try and make it quality of life. But not disappear? But nothing, nothing. So how did you feel when, when you heard that news? Uh, it's, it's a strange feeling because um, I went to Medjugorje not looking for anything, Ryan. Yeah. I went it because it was to be my last holiday with yeah. Anne. And uh, to experience no vomiting, no diarrhea, no cramping pain. But it was really the day after the healing that I realized something had happened. Was it I a miracle, do you think, David? Sorry? Was it a miracle? Well, I classify it as a miracle, yeah. And many people would do, many doctors. Uh, doctors that I would meet as I do my concerts all over the world would say it's definitely, definitely. a miracle, yeah. And what about you, David? Do you, do you attribute your recovery to Medjugorje as, yeah. as a... As a as, a, as a, yeah. a miraculous event or yeah. just something that you just copped on? Well, to be honest with you, there's not many people who's on methadone in Ireland who come off, you know, so I really do believe the life, myself and my wife live at the minute, that it's divine help that yeah. helps us to stay away from drugs, you know? So that's, that's, that's changed yeah. your, whole, your yeah. whole life. Yeah. And, and how do you answer sceptics? Because it'd be hard to be sceptical talking to you, I have to say. Yeah, but I mean, it, it's like what Maureen said, everybody has their opinion of, of, of things that happen in life. And I have the great privilege of working in Medjugorje. I work for Marian Pilgrimages there. So I would see skeptics on a daily basis. But there is that peace within Medjugorje. Like, I see me arriving on a bus every week. Uh, you do, yeah. Kicking and screaming and fighting. Yeah. And then within two days, there's this peace that... It's like this if our lady takes us. Uh, a real mother takes us to her son. And that's the way it is for me. And one of the messages of our lady was that she came to Medjugorje to say that Jesus loves us. And that's the message. Well, we're going to leave it there, but thank you so much for coming in and telling us your stories this, this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Damien and David, thanks so much. And also to Mary and Louise, thank you. So there you are, that's where we're going to leave it. Uh, Medjugorje, what it means to me, is also available in most bookshops. Now, that is it, ladies and gentlemen, for tonight's show. Hope you